I welcome everybody. Um, we're going to let everybody start filtering in as we've just opened the webinar. We'll start the webinar in a minute. Welcome to everybody that's just joining. We will be starting in just a minute. For some housekeeping issues, um, anyone that would like to ask questions to our panelists, please use the Q&A uh, icon on your screen to ask the questions and uh, they will answer them um, during their discussion. Okay. I'm sure there's still going to be people filtering in, but uh, we will get started so that you have enough time. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Debbie Nickisher. I am the secretary of SBI2, and we really hope that you're enjoying the conference today and that you'll stay with us tomorrow. Um, we are here at the roundtable um, entitled Exploring High Contents Utilization in 2D and 3D Virology Applications from Assay Development to High Throughput Screening. Um, I would like to introduce Nick Radio, who is the Global Product Manager for Thermo Fisher Scientific um, as part of High Content Screening Technologies. Uh, Nick will bring you through um, the background of your discussion and, in, and introduce the panelists. Nick? Thank you so much, Debbie, and thanks for everybody for attending. Um, I was pretty excited at the rumor that this was going to be happening in Pittsburgh this year, which is where I live. Uh, but it's good to see you virtually, and hopefully we can get a rain check on that perhaps in 2021. Um, Debbie, if you could go on to the next slide, please. So just a quick uh, agenda before I introduce the panelists. Um, so we're going to be going over virology with regard to high content, some comparisons with more traditional assays. Um, looking at the benefits and challenges in both 2D and 3D as it relates to assay development as well as screening. So optimizing the conditions, figuring out um, uh, optimal settings, and then from there moving it into a higher throughput application. Um, this is really meant to be more scientific based, more technical. Uh, so we appreciate the time uh, that you spend with us and without Further ado, let me introduce my panelists. <clears throat> um, so, guest first, uh, Dr. Rania Francis is a PhD scientist from the Mediterranean Virology Institute. Uh, Rania is based in uh, Marcel's France, and I appreciate that it's uh, 10 o'clock there where you're at, Rania. So, thank you so much for joining us. 
Uh, Rania is a first author on several papers that are very related to this field, including one recent one on COVID-19 for uh, virology applications. Um, next, outside of the Thermo Fisher family is James Evans. Um, so James is the CEO and founder at Fina Vista. Uh, he has been in high content for longer than about anybody I know, and his expertise is uh, world renowned. So I appreciate uh, James coming on and talking about what they see at Fina Vista uh, as a contract research organization. And then I'm very pleased to uh, have two colleagues of mine. Uh, so Dr. Michelle Yan and Dr. Daniel Beecham joining me, um, especially under the circumstances. So both Michelle and Dan, I think this is the first time I've seen you without face masks on because between COVID-19 safety restrictions and then in Eugene, the fire hazards, it's been um, pretty chaotic. So it's, uh, A, it's great to see both of you uh, out of harm's way and able to join us here for this session. So I, you know, I think we have an all-star uh, panel and um, I have a couple of slides that are really meant to introduce some of the topics um, and then from there, we will open it up into the panel discussion. So, um, you know, prior to 2020 and the disaster that is COVID-19, um, there was a fairly significant amount of work using high content for virology applications. Um, I think one of the most influential papers was, was a methods development paper out of the CDC um, where they were able to show, um, you know, a cross correlation between the more traditional plaque detection assays and neutralization assays with high content, which we'll go into in a little bit. Um, there's others much more qualified than me to talk about the benefits. So uh, I'll let Rania Francis and James et al. Uh, go over some of the other benefits. But I think the one thing that is definitely key to point out um, with the advantages is just how because the technology is automated and the algorithms are set for automating the image analysis it really provides for a hands-free automated solution which with social distancing and reduced staffing um, allows us to be you know at some level productive despite the, the staffing challenges um, it is important to note that the technology has been used in BSL-3 and 4 labs. Um, it can be um, used in a way that minimizes uh, hands-on approaches. You can use robotics and things like cytomat incubators to make it uh, even turnkey for live cell applications. And from influenza to Ebola to Zika virus to HIV and then more recently COVID-19, there's a number of applications showing its um, utility in this space. So um, let's get into it. Uh, Debbie, if you could go in the next slide, please. All right, so I hope I'm not insulting anybody's intelligence here. Um, these next couple of slides are just primer slides on um, virology 101. Uh, this first, out of the way. All right. um, this first is a uh, the traditional plaque assay. So what you're looking at is a uh, out of a virus stock. It's a one to ten serial dilution on down. So going from left to the right. Uh, the whole point of this is to evaluate viral potency. Um, so the uh, cell monolayer is exposed to the virus. It's allowed at incubation time. Infected cells will release viral progeny that will spread to neighboring cells. This results in the circular zone of infected cells, which uh, I don't have control of the screen, but it's the non-blue uh, part of the, the screen, EES. So those uh, where you're not seeing the crystal violet blue staining, any absence areas is the plaque itself. Uh, so from there, you can take the viral titer and uh, quantify the plaque formation units or PFU. And 
historically this was done by a technician manually counting each one of those. Um, this technology has been around for a while. So I think 1953 was the first time that it was actually published. Um, and it, it has served as the gold standard. Um, so this is looking at uh, essentially the potency of the virus to be able to replicate and form these plaques. Um, a related assay that you'll see, uh, Debbie, if you could go to the next one, please, is the neutralization assay. So a neutralization assay is more on the therapeutic side where you're evaluating for antibodies in a serum to be able to neutralize the plaque. So uh, what you're looking at here on that right-hand side, the upper right-hand quadrant is H1N1 immunized rabbit serum. And then um, you're seeing a, a one to two dilution scheme going left to right. And then on the bottom, it's a, uh, negative control non-immunized rabbit serum. So note that at fairly low concentrations with the H1N1 immunized rabbit serum, uh, we're not seeing really significant plaque formation until about 1 to 5, 12, where with the non-immunized, the plaque formation is observed much earlier. So that PRNT90, that's the 90% reduction in the number of viral plaques achieved through innovation with uh, the antibody serum. So, um, as I said, th this is the gold standard assay, but it does have a number of limitations. So, um, Rania could definitely talk to this better than I can, but it is relatively expensive, labor intensive. Uh, it is usually ma manually counted, so there is uh, person to person and time to time variability in scoring. It takes up to 10 days in order to uh, complete the test. So it, um, it's not really amenable to a, a higher throughput application where you would have a lot of samples like here in 2020 with uh, the COVID-19 epidemic. Um, next slide, please. All right, so um, this, this paper came out of the CDC in 2015. Um, so Kevin Karam's lab, Irina Gates was the prior, uh, primary author. Uh, this was done on an array scan platform where they were able to compare these manual based assays, assays that were being performed at the CD at the time and cross compare them with um, the high throughput, high content results. And you'll see the, uh, the comparisons are, are uh, significantly positive. Uh, next slide, please. So here, instead of looking at the plaque formations, you're looking at titers where um, 24 hours post-infection, the samples were screened with different MOI concentrations going from left to right. So by the time you get to the uh, lower right-hand corner, they're uninfected cells, and they're essentially looking for uh, the presence of the green fluorescence in the cytoplasm of the cell. Um, if we go to the next slide, so here is where on the, on the y-axis, this is looking at the high content uh, plaque assay, and then on the x-axis horizontally is uh, looking at this using the gold standard manual method. Uh, so what they published was, was extremely good, a Pearson's correlation of 0.95, p-value less than 0.0001. So a uh, very high degree of correlation between the two assays. Um, they then followed it up with, if we go into the next slide. So this is a correlation looking at uh, neutralization between uh, high content versus um, a GFP viral vector method. So uh, again, we're seeing a, a correlation of 0 0.9 with a p-value of 0 0.001. And there were um, a number of advantages cited here, but the earlier detection of the virus, uh, the ability to use smaller samples, the ability of having the images on a secure server, and then they talk about you know, potentially multiplexing this with other 
mechanism of action to further figure out um, uh, the underlying cause of the cell death. So, and this, this was a pretty influential paper because from here, there were a number of other studies that I would call them applications into other viral types. Uh, so if we go on to the next slide. So uh, Dr. Kartik Chandran, uh, this is out of Albert Einstein College of Medicine. Um, they were a pretty productive lab in this field. So they went on to show viral infectivity using HCS. Um, it was a 2018 Nature paper, I believe. And if we go to the next slide, Debbie, it will show us. So uh, similar to the CDC findings, uh, they showed a very high correlation uh, in U2OS cells with or without a CD not, uh, cDNA knockout. So with this, they were able to show that not only could you apply the technology to a different virus, they could also look at GFP positive cells uh, and show uh, different conditions of infectivity uh, using the virus. And if we go on to the next slide, So also out of New York City, but a different lab. So this is NYU uh, Medical Center. Um, in this group, they were looking at uh, Chikundra virus E1, and they were looking at different glycoprotein determinants that were responsible for controlling the infectivity of the virus. Um, so here, we're starting to see more regulatory paths that are understood uh, they're starting to show different ways that the viral infectivity can be modulated uh, through application of this automated technology. And one of the things that I think is important to note here is that there, you know, the number of variables, the number of conditions uh, with each of these papers, it's in the hundreds to thousands as they begin to um, look at different experimental conditions for these individual viruses. Um, the next couple of slides will show uh, looking at more therapeutic based methods. So it went from looking at infectivity and the virus's ability to um, show potency to uh, ways to therapeutically neutralize them. In some cases like this study, which again, these, it's just a U2OS monolayer. So we're talking uh, definitely a 2D example but here they're able to show um, different ways of uh, controlling therapeutic antibody conditions to gauge for whether or not you can reduce um, the infectivity of these viral progeny. So um, what's, I think what's relevant here is that we're beginning to see further, um, further screening with multiple conditions um, in most of these papers, they were done in at least triplicate replicates and then multiple concentrations to understand uh, just the potency and the dose responsive nature of these different mechanisms. Um, if we go to the next slide. So um, 2018, I don't know if everybody remembers, but this is where we started to see the random Ebola outbreaks. So um, this paper was, uh, at the time, pretty significant because they were showing the use of monoclonal antibodies that had better selectivity for Ebola virus and then uh, running through a screen to show the, what uh, variants of the antibody could contribute best to Ebola protection. So, you know, we're seeing this continuum of not only are people accepting that you can use this as a modern replacement of the traditional plaque assays, but utilizing the higher throughput nature of it in order to um, determine what conditions best can neutralize the virus. So, as I said, there was a lot of uh, foundational work that built into where we're at 
uh, more recently. So if we go on to the next slide, um, and then one final one. So this is another where they were looking at um, understanding the individual sites that were responsible. Um, that, that's good. We can go ahead and go to the next one. <clears throat> so um, from there, we started seeing a uptick in repurposing of pharmaceuticals towards antiviral therapies. So this was uh, Pariamax. It was a paper out of uh, Research Triangle Park where they were trying to understand is there a way of showing a synergistic increase with different repurposed pharmacologicals using high content technologies to apply multiple doses across multiple chemical libraries. What was significant here was that these compounds are already FDA approved. So, you know, it's significantly faster to get a new application out of a already approved drug versus trying to revalidate a new API. And then finally from here, we're gonna start seeing some of the more recent COVID work. So um, out of uh, City University of Hong Kong, this was one of the first papers where they utilized high content technology to screen repurposed compounds against SARS-CoV-2. Uh, um, the technology was used to identify berbenine, which was a compound that they were able to show reduce the endolysomal trafficking of the viral receptors which reduced the ability of the virus to proliferate. And then, I don't wanna steal Rania's thunder, but if we go on to the next slide. So Dr. Rania Francis, the lead author on uh, this study that we're highlighting, the, their lab at the Mediterranean Virology Institute used high content to accelerate uh, on clinical screening and um, I'll let Rania uh, go through the science there, but it was definitely one of the leading papers showing that in actual human clinical samples, you could apply this technology, uh, cross comparing it with things like RT-PCR, and then talking about some of the advantages of an imaging-based technology versus uh, RT-PCR uh, type of technology. And then, the last slide, I believe, this will serve as kind of a jumping point, but we're starting to see, uh, especially for coronavirus toxicology, the use of organoids, uh, spheroids, looking at um, how coronavirus is causing toxic toxicological mechanisms. You know, the premise here is that these models can more faithfully replicate what is going on in vivo. And with that, there is a reduced leap of faith that what you're seeing in these in vitro model systems will match what you see clinically. Um, so this was a, an excerpt out of Nature that came out recently where they talked about its ability to attack the heart, um, looking at the bronchial epithelial cells in the lung, uh, looking at intestinal work, and they're, you know, it's snapshots of showing higher sensitivity, um, hopefully better reproducibility for what's going on clinically. But even here, they mentioned that there's no perfect model. Uh, when you're using a mini organoid, let's say you're using a mini lung model, there's still not that organ to organ interaction like you would have in a person in vivo so then they go on to say, even in this, there's you know, the likelihood that you would have to further go through and do another more comprehensive screen. So um, I wanted this to be relatively brief. Um, with this, we have some questions that I'd love to uh, open it up to the panel. Um, so just jumping off of what we were talking about relative to um, 2D monolayers versus 3D versus organoids, spheroids. Um, so one of the things that we wanted to talk about was scientific and technical challenges of adopting these in a 2D, 2D model and then in a 3D model. Uh, would one of our panelists like to take this point? 
Rania, did you want to have a talk about that, or do, would you like me to? Uh, yes, you can. Uh, you can go ahead and start. Oh, okay. All right. Well, thank, thanks, Nick. That was a really, uh, really interesting uh, uh, overview. Uh, I learned a lot, actually. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't be on this panel, but uh, thanks for everybody uh, tuning in for this. Um, so yeah, Fina Vista, we, we provide um, services to um, all sorts of clients and, and we offer 2D and 3D services. So um, we're kind of uh, well positioned to talk about um, some of the pros and the cons of, of each of those um, approaches. Um, you know, the, 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 the main thing, the, sort of the bottom line is, you know, 2D is a lot simpler. Um, it's easier to scale up. Um, but, you know, 3D is, is very trendy right now. And it's also, you know, the hope is that you get um, more relevant, physiologically relevant information. But, you know, rule of thumb for us is that 3D, 3D work, you know, you're going to pay a penalty about 100, 10 to 100 fold in terms of throughput and, and sort of costs and things like that. So that there's definitely um, pros and cons. Um, but, you know, 3D is now... A real, a real thing that you can do at, at reasonable scale, and you know, only a few years ago it really wasn't. So, um, you know, things will continue to improve, and um, yeah. James, can you talk a little bit about um, like sensitivity and/or selectivity concerns when you're talking about 2D versus 3D? And Ron, yeah. I want to chime in here, <laughs> especially for the 2D work. Um, you are definitely qualified to do so. Um, well, I mean, I, I or Michelle. Yeah, I can. Uh, I can yeah. Sorry. Yep. Go ahead. I, I, sorry, I was just going to say. I mean, it's it's um, <clears throat> you know, as soon as you move from two D monocultures to two D co-cultures, for example, you know, an easy example, not necessarily virology related, but is, is the uh, the impact that astrocytes have on neurological. Um, uh, co you know, neuron co cultures, you know, they, they you know, provide a lot of buffering. So any, any multi-cell uh, model, you know, is, is going gonna, is gonna to affect the sensitivity, you know, by, by providing some potential shielding or amplification of, of effects. Um, and in 3D, you know, especially with like cancer type uh, models, you know, you have um, further sort of physical, sort of steric um, uh, inhibition or, 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 or aspects of, you know, penetration of a, a therapeutic agent into the, the center of a, uh, of, of an organoid or a spheroid, depending on what you're looking at. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's really hard to give a sort of a, a general, a general answer to that, but, um, yeah, as things become more complicated, things become more complicated. Sorry, Rania, you probably have a much more sensible answer than me. Uh, yes, I'm sorry I got disconnected <laughs> for a while. Nick, did you want to re re uh, yeah, repeat no, the question for Rania? Yeah, no problem. Yes, yes. Uh, welcome back, Rania. So this was just uh, the sensitivity and or selectivity concerns. Um, Maybe if you can comment about more of the, the 2D domain uh, based upon your work. Yes, uh, so basically in our work, we were uh, using live cell imaging more, more, li more than fixed cells. So here uh, a bigger problem, a bigger challenge with sensitivity occurs, especially coming from uh, uncontrolled cells uh, that could really affect uh, the, the outcome of the algorithm that could be used. It could really uh, uh, give a false results if it was negative or positive. So that could be coming from artifacts, from dead cells, from, uh, uh, from anything that, that coming from clinical samples. That's what we, we work on. So um, in our applications, we, we really try to, uh, to overcome these, these challenges and try to uh, to find solutions for this because we cannot really control uh, all the aspects of, of life cell cultures. 
and uh, we we try to to remove uh, artifacts with with the algorithm but it's not all, always uh, successful especially when working on bright field images uh, so here we uh, we had uh, uh, a lot of uh, of artifacts that could interfere with the algorithm so we uh, we re we're really facing a lot of false positive results and try to uh, uh, to uh, to overcome it by comparing uh, comparing it to, to the database of negative and positive controls that that we de that we developed uh, in order to minimize and set uh, a positivity threshold to uh, to detect the infections that we were following. Yeah. James, could I, could I repose Nick's question to you a little bit more about the sensitivity? Because I, I wonder about this as well and some of the development stuff we do, even just in the HTS domain with microplates and ensemble responses. Um, in, in migrating an assay from 2D to 3D, let's take a case study, say, where you see a, a right shift in the EC50 of a drug, and then you can describe that differences in penetrance. That's not, so penetrance is one of the metrics you mentioned that you, know, you can now assay in a third dimension. Are there mechanistic things that have emerged though also as, as such a result you know in addition to the maybe the buffering effect as you mentioned of, of you know uh, satellite cells and, and so forth but what what beyond the, the buffering effects or the penetrance kind of things uh, have emerged you know because it seems like virology would be very ripe for the particularly the infectivity and refectivity reinfection uh, in a third dimension where the cells are infecting suddenly their neighbors on three sides rather than mm. in a monolayer yeah, I, I wish I had. I wish I had the experience to uh, to answer that question. I think um, you know it's still early days. We haven't really seen um, adoption of of three D screening, particularly in 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 this in virology, um, you know, being requested from from our clients yet. But but that might change, you know, the next six to twelve months. But certainly, it would be you know interesting to look to be able to track. Um, infection and propagation and viral load within within a structure um, uh, it's certainly technically feasible but you know it's just it's one of those things that uh, hasn't really uh, we haven't done we haven't done yet but uh, yeah interesting question Thanks, ben. so the I'm trying to be mindful of the chat going on. So the last couple of minutes, we've got a couple of questions. Judy Warwell Swanson, uh, it's good to see yeah. your name. Uh, so Judy asks a follow-up question. Is it your impression that the sensitivity, sensitivity shift observed when moving from 2D to 3D brings us closer to being able to estimate efficacious in vivo exposures? Dan's shaking his head yes. One, one, one hopes, I guess that's the investment that the field is making uh, with, this, with this approach. Uh, ha have such models emerged? Because yeah, the, uh, the intrinsic value of any assay is only as good as its predictive value of the more expensive assay down the line. So moving away from behavioral pharmacology and into sort of hopefully some tissue-based uh, studies, uh, safety seems to lead the way usually with these kind of models, right? You know, IPSC models and so forth. So the safety pharmacology community might be the first to really start to establish these. Uh, but I, 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 I'm kind of hoping my academic panelists be able to point to the case studies where there was something more than the penetrance uh, that was affected. Because um, have there been nice, some nice uh, mechanistic uh, discoveries that were enabled in 3D? Maybe turn that to the audience. I, I'm 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 sort of a you know the, on the reagents and indicators development and tools side, but we we yeah. to approximate the systems in house as well and, and get nice pharmacology and you know we we reliably reproduce the right shifts in in, in um you know e efficacy of, of cell death or activation of a of, of various pathways. But I, I am kind of curious. Has 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 someone redirected a campaign because of a finding uh, in HCA that they uh, may have missed otherwise or waited until behavioral pharmacology. Yeah, so for sure they're seeing efficacy and potency differences 2D and 3D in 
uh, oncology, amino oncology, uh, neuroscience, um, you know, in neuroscience, the presence of the blood brain barrier among other barriers, you know, it's definitely a more faithful example that people I would say in general, there's, there's more trust on that, uh, relative to in vivo. I haven't seen a whole lot in the virology space showing 2D to 3D. Uh, I have a pretty strong feeling with COVID-19 that'll be changing. Uh, there has been in reviewing the literature more, um, you know, use of steroid models to begin to screen, but as far as 2D to 3D comparisons, um, it's not, it's, it's a little early. Um, Debbie Nickisher would like to answer this question live. Debbie? No, I was just gonna move it over since you answered it. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> Sorry, I am a rookie to this. Um, all right, the next question I saw was about AI, and I think that's artificial intelligence. So have people considered using HCS virology assays using AI uh, for identification validation? I'm, I'm sure I mean, I, 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 mean, <laughs> I, I, mean we, we, I mean, we apply AI and machine learning approaches uh, to complex data sets and certainly 3D, uh, 3D data sets are, are more complex than typically. So um, yeah, I mean, we throw, we throw whatever machinery or whatever uh, tools we can at, at uh, data sets, depending on, on what the questions are um, that, that the client, our clients ask for. So um, I think the answer, short answer is yes. No, we've recently deployed AI to improve the sort of quality control and selecting spheroids in our high content platform. That was a high content or rather an AI enabled, you know, software effort on our, on our part to bring that, that, uh, that upgrade. But I'm sure that in the academic world, particularly, you know, luminaries like Ann Carpenter at, at the Broad are probably working now to deploy, uh, you know, w with tools like AI to deploy, you know, uh, virology applications among all the other live cell and exotic, you know, difficult test cases that they've rolled out with uh, the cell profiler. and uh, yeah. So yeah, well, that's definitely where, so there's, there's a couple of, so other non-direct or unknown mechanisms on targets or cannot be identified. So essentially, yeah. but you're looking for a priori going into it. And especially yeah. since most true virology assays may require BSL-3. Uh, Rania, could you take that one? Uh, yes, of course, uh, most true virology assays require BSL-3, especially since, uh, especially when working with, uh, with live imaging. Uh, a lot of uh, viruses are uh, class 2 viruses, but uh, for, more, uh, for more safety reasons, it's better to always work in BSL-3 labs. And uh, where the trends now are uh, the coronavirus, the measles virus, etc. These are all class 3 pathogens. So. Uh, it would be always better to work in BSL3, even if they are fixed, there's always a risk of, of, of contamination at some level. So yes, always work in BSL3 labs. I'll, I'll echo that. Rania, what's the, what's the academic and medical field's disposition toward um, sort of uh, BSL2 reagents, like the virus-like particles that can be generated from the coat proteins and other model systems? Does it have to be a, a, a I'm just curious about, maybe it depends, of course, on the assay you're doing, uh, you know, MOA or otherwise, but how, how, is, how does the virology uh, field feel about, you know, some of these surrogate systems that are BSL-1 and 2, uh, in, in particular, the virus-like particle model, BLP? Uh, yes, uh, it's, it's not always a problem to work uh, with uh, in the SL2 labs uh, if, if the cells are fixed, if the virus are inactivated. Uh, but uh, yeah, not, not everyone has, uh, has the, uh, the equipment to, to work in the SL3 labs. So they, they only s stick uh, uh, to working in the SL3 labs when they are using live particles, live viruses, but all other applications where, you are, where they are fixed, they are inactivated. It's basically used in uh, in BSL, done in BSL two labs. 
Yeah, the, the person asking this may in fact be Ann Carpenter or Ann Hoffman. I just see Ann. Um, and one final question. <clears throat> Probes slash needs have, have to be progressed to do more in the area for a high throughput. So uh, Michelle and or Dan, do you want to take this one on on the probe side? Uh, what was the beginning of the question I didn't hear? So relative to virology, uh, what probes uh, have progressed and what is like the unmet need for higher throughput? Oh, um, well, specific for virology, I, I would say like right now it's like maybe antibody targets, but I don't like for functional assays. When I look at those papers, it's like really simple fluorescent dyes. So I think, you know, for us, we don't do a lot of validation in models that are not um, like mammalian cell culture. So that's, I feel like the unmet need is that we, we just don't know like how the fluorescent dyes work in different types of models. Dan, do you have anything to add? I guess, yeah, I, I, would, I would just maybe, I, would, I, I was thinking that more that, so the, the question sounded like it had two parts. What needs have we met? And we've got, got some current tools in our box that might be relevant to viral. And then what needs are out there that we could strive toward or might even have on our radar? But as far as the needs we have met, well, you see, yeah, so right now our three, our, our, our uh, imaging and, and reagent offerings in, in high content could be reviewed offline by seminars with Nick or me or Michelle here. But we, we do have a, a large toolbox and primarily the main needs still remain uh, effective cell segmentation, you know, and effective multiplex uh, uh, in, in, in with you know, maintaining a spatial resolution uh, that you've gone to all the trouble to capture uh, by, by bothering to do high content, right? By not doing flow. Uh, so you're, it's hopefully that, it, you know, all, I think our, like Michelle mentioned, our, our, our validated antibody tools will always sort of be our primary foothold there. But our, our, our segmentation tools, I think, uh, are a place where we have met needs and are always looking for better solutions. And then uh, increasingly these functional needs, right? So assays that are and I don't know really, we've kind of gone back and forth on the foundational tools approach, as you mentioned, just the dyes or canned assays that have a, a workflow and all the reagents that you need and the required buffers that reliably solve the problem in a sort of a CRO way. And um, for virology, we have a number of sort of, we have a, a large infectious disease portfolio, most notably that's we, that, we, that we do actively service in the form of new generation pH sensor dyes that monitor internalization but those are by definition live cell assays and difficult to adopt in high content. So they, they store, stay more in the realm of imaging and mechanism of action. Our HCA tools are still largely endpoint focused and we're, we're making better, I think I really, if anything, Thermo Fisher's in my view from R&D, our, our biggest spend in recent years has been the uh, sort of taking over and re, reinventing HCA from, from not just the uh, reagent side. You know, integrating our tools with our science and our and our our breadth is has been a big focus for us. So, um, I you know, the, the reinvent part is is really I feel like what where the you know our attentions will be. But uh, you know, the virology focus part. Hopefully, we can. I'd love to see us resource some some attention there. Yeah, and I think the other thing we've been working on as part of the unmet need is not specifically. If, to virology, but into like when you do 3D models is understanding how our functional dyes and reagents work in 3D models. And I think it goes back to a little bit of the sensitivity and understanding when you have false negatives or false positives is that if you don't see fluorescence in like the center of a steroid, is it because the dye didn't get there or is it because there's really no signal? And mm -hmm. so I think I feel like in the past few years, we've been making a bigger effort just to evaluate our current dyes and how they work in uh, 3D models and then offering some, you know, suggestions on like how you can get them to work in 3D models. We do have a landing page of validated assays that we have, you know, kind of like if you think of the dyes out there, some of them, a subset of them are 
useful for two, two, two photon imaging, something like that, right? They're, they have their own little subset. And we do have, I feel like, a pretty good landing page for, for HCA validated uh, dyes and dye systems that, that um, you know, that, that's easy to navigate. But uh, I, I also am always looking for the off-label stuff. So that's really what I'm hoping to hear more from our panelists about. Yeah, I'll tell you what, um, time flies when you're having fun. Let's do one more question and then we'll move on. So last one was, how about instrumentation and inability to go beyond 120 microns of depth? Can you study spheroids slash organoids without looking at the signals in the entire spheroid? Which uh, I'm asking, especially after what your commentary, Michelle, there on getting the label inside of the core. Um, this is open for anybody. Um, I'll take it. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, we, you know, it, it, is, it is. So you can get further than 120 uh, with a long working distance um, objective, um, you know, if you make trade offs with the magnification. Um, certainly, clearing agents. Are, and the clearing process for, for 3D um, or your organoids um, is, is a really important time-consuming um, process. Um, and then in terms of validating or having internal controls for penetrance versus um, uh, you know, lack of presence of a signal in, in the center of a, of a structure, um, you know, you, you always want to have an internal control. So if you have, um, you know, a validated antibody and you, 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 should, you know, will hopefully know something about the composition of your structure, but, um, you know, you, you should be able to show that, um, you know, the, 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 the relative penetrance of, a, of an antibody versus target one versus target two um, should be similar. And, um, and, you know, if, if, it, if it suddenly isn't on, a, on an experiment, then you know that something, you know, you'd go back and, you know, check and troubleshoot and see if there was a problem with a, um, you know, a process or a reagent. So, um, yeah, hopefully that, I mean, certainly, you know, if you want to <laughs> bring out the big guns, you can get an automated multi-photon microscope and then you have no problems, but, uh, not a lot of people are doing that in uh, in the screening environment uh, yet. So let's let's move on. And this was we started getting there with some of the labeling questions. But is there an emerging role for functional and/or live cell virology applications? Um, so in our pre-discussion, we talked about internalization, trafficking, pH changes. Um, Michelle, Dan, I mean, and this is open to anybody. And I would say this falls more on the assay development side of the house as far as determining the optimal conditions before you move into a higher throughput scenario. I, I will take this on. So this is basically the core of our, uh, of our work uh, in, in the lab here. So we're basically trying to apply high content screening to clinical uh, microbiology or virology especially and try to develop life cell uh, analysis, uh, targeting uh, microbes isolation from clinical samples, drug testing, uh, uh, vir virulence uh, testing, epidemiological studies, etc. So we're focusing on life cell images because they, they give us uh, a, a more real uh, image on how the virus is interacting with the cells. Uh, if we are testing a uh, a panel of different cell lines to see which ones are more susceptible to the virus, which could, uh, uh, which could answer many of the clinical questions. Uh, but here, the, the main challenges that we face here is, uh, like you said, Nick, the, the, at the developmental stage to, to, to determine the optimal uh, conditions for the assay or for the culture. We have uh, to control uh, the cells from one side and the microbes from the other side, if it was viruses or, or bacteria. So it's very difficult to maintain a life cell culture for the uh, long uh, uh, duration that, that is needed. For example, for viruses, it could go from uh, uh, 
I'm, I'm going to give an example of, uh, for the isolation of microorganisms. Uh, to isolate a virus from clinical sample, it could uh, take from 12 up to seven days, 12 hours up to seven days. Uh, for intracellular bacteria, it could go on for uh, even 30 days or more uh, to be able to isolate the bacteria. Uh, so. Here, come, here comes the biggest challenge to maintain a life culture, especially in the uh, miniaturized uh, models in 96 well microplates or others, where the, the culture medium volume is very minimal, uh, cells will get dehydrated, dehydrated over time. So we have to take into account all these, uh, all these factors. Uh, and adding to this comes the choice of the appropriate uh, fluorescent dye that we will be using to, for, to develop the assay. So that we have limited choice. We cannot uh, use antibodies specific for, for the viruses. We, we have to stick to live cell imaging. Uh, mainly uh, the, most, the easiest one to, to use for, uh, for cell uh, detection and segmentation is the DNA staining, live DNA staining. And uh, uh, on this point, I would uh, I want to give a comment on the uh, uh, on the toxicity uh, effect that we uh, we saw with with the life staining. Uh, even if uh, if they can penetrate into the cells, they don't have a direct cytotoxic effect. Uh, uh, with a prolonged contact contact for two or three days, uh, cells will will eventually die or get deformed. Or uh, we were seeing nuclear. Uh, uh, fragmentation. So that's also to take into account. Uh, we had to fix uh, uh, time points uh, where, where we were adding the, the fluorescent dyes and when we were doing the screening, especially when, uh, when following up or monitoring uh, infectious cycles of viruses or, or bacteria. So uh, those are mainly uh, on the life cell, life cell virology applications that we, were, uh, that we were having in our lab. Uh, we, we mainly, we, we also uh, developed uh, live drug testing uh, uh, assay. Uh, we tried to keep, uh, to keep the, uh, this assay with, with live cells, tried to test different, uh, uh, different pharmaceuticals, uh, especially for the SARS-CoV-2 uh, applications, uh, is it because it gave more, uh, a, a better insight on uh, on the actual effect uh, on the viral multiplication, and we compared all the results with the uh, RT-PCR quantifications uh, in order to uh, to, va to validate the proof of concept uh, for the HTS application on uh, for drug testing. So, yes, that's mainly uh, uh, an overall uh, uh, idea on the on the life cell virology and their potential applications. Well, I'm curious what Thank you, Ron. And what? Uh, go ahead. Go ahead, Dan. I was just kind of, kind of pick up there. I was curious what the, you know, the functional need was that led you to live cell imaging. Because again, usually it's kind of it's not a last resort, but it's, it, it might be where an assay is born, you know, in the in the discovery phases or in, in, in out in academy and published. But people usually try to quickly migrate assay to an endpoint, uh, you know, where, where cells are involved, and so. Um, Again, as I mentioned, the uh, uh, you know uh, the, um, the the exceptions are usually in safety pharmacology or places like this where there's a time domain. But I mean, just by working with live cells, by definition, you have a sampling interval in some part of a time domain that is that you need to monitor uh, and catch a transient signal that would otherwise be be passed by. What what are the kinds of things that, that force you know? Uh, an assay into the into the world of live cells because I mean my examples are easy you know calcium or um, you know sort of ephemeral signaling molecules and things like this so in virology is the are the needs going to be you know on the internalization side or the, it, these because what you're looking at in these assays from Nick's presentation uh, were largely infectivity kind of you know plaque type assays but are there cell up do we need cell level information uh, from from viruses uh, in this context. Uh it into uh, a question, but uh, yes, in the in the context of uh, of infectivity, uh, we need uh, we need cells just to to monitor the uh, uh, the infectious state of the of the virus. So, uh, for for our applications, uh, we were trying to at the beginning to replace the traditional uh, 
traditional techniques uh, that, that were manual, uh, time consuming. Uh, uh, if it was for, for my, uh, microorganism isolation or for drug testing or whatever, we tried to replace them with, an, with a more automated system and objective analysis with algorithms and image analysis. So that was uh, the start point. But in terms of life, that's why we, uh, we had to go to life cell because we were trying to isolate microorganisms. We needed them to stay alive. We couldn't fix or do just an end, uh, end, time, uh, end time analysis. But in, uh, in, a more, uh, in, in other perspectives, yes, in, to, to study uh, certain internalization or, uh, or, or, if, uh, or the, the effect of, a, uh, of a certain molecules on the, on the virus or on the cells, we do not need live cell imaging. So this depends on the uh, on the thematic, uh, the research thematic. What you need to do, uh, what are your perspectives? So for for our lab, this is our main focus for now. So we we, we are still at the at the beginning of the high content applications. We, it hasn't been so long uh, that we uh, that we started applying them. We started from here in order to uh, uh, update or upgrade our uh, diagnostic lab and introduce uh, automated systems, but we will go on and continue and develop different uh, other assays. We, we, we are trying now to, uh, to develop a, a, something equivalent to the plaque assay and the neutralization yeah. assay that Nick mentioned, but uh, also in, with life cells, we, uh, we needed to, uh, to combine them with the isolation of, of the measles virus that is traditionally uh, tested and uh, with the neutralization test. So that's, uh, that's one of the perspectives we are currently working on. But uh, besides that, uh, we, uh, the applications of the live cell imaging are very limited because they are more difficult to, uh, to apply overall than just fixed cells. Yeah, and one other point, and then in the interest of time, we got to move on. The, that mechanism of action work is definitely emerging. Um, I don't see him on here, but shout out to Johnny Sexton at University of Michigan. They had a really nice study that was centered around repurposing and, you know, you're starting to see people move into multiple colors, multiple channels, multi-parameter uh, digging to understand not just do you see infectivity, but what is the underlying fingerprint? What is the underlying mechanism? Um, I feel bad that we're not going to get to all these questions, but I'll try to get to a couple more. Um, what, what are the main challenges moving from the assay development mode to the higher throughput mode, uh, especially for higher, you know, volumes of pharmaceuticals or just larger volume needed for scalability? Well, consistency of reagents and cells is for sure um, an issue again, consistent plate to plate um, quality of, uh, you know, starting material. Um, that's probably, probably the biggest thing. Um, yeah. And what about just the real estate of, especially if you're 1536 well plates and you've got a million compound library that you're trying to screen. What just the efficiencies of fixed versus live cell there? Yeah, I mean, so yeah, 1536. Um, yeah, pretty pretty difficult. Um, we we, uh, we we typically work in 384 well um, and, and 384 low volume. Um, yeah, so. Yeah, I mean, yeah, the, the, the challenges are, I mean, compared with 2D, it's, it's you know, like I said, probably uh, 10 to 100 times uh, more more effort when you when you start stacking up. There's this, I mean, I made a note just as we were sort of getting prepared for this. I mean, you know, compared from 2D to 3D, you know, just in general, even regardless of virology, you know, create the models and validating the models is, is more difficult in 3D. You know, you've got more cell types, you have to check are, are growing properly and expressing the right markers. So that's, that's one thing that's harder. Once you get the, let's just say, organoids growing well and consistent, handling them and getting them into wells and keeping them there while you stain them. So all that kind of just handling the material is, is a challenge. Um, then you've got um, you know application of the of the treatments or the test agents and things like that and, and sort of uh, 
you know, applying those and, and knowing they get where you want them to get and, and, uh, and being able to do multiple applications and washouts and things like that, that's a challenge more than, more than the 2D. Then as we've, we've covered, you know, the, 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 uh, the labeling and staining, um, you know, if you're doing live or you're doing, or you're doing fixed and you've got the, um, the clearing agent, um, process and all that. So it's definitely something you, you wouldn't normally need in 2D. Imaging has covered that, you know, that, that takes, you know, you probably need more sophisticated, uh, imaging platform and, and that platform is going to take longer to scan than it would for, for a 2D. The analysis of those images, that's all going to be hard too. And, um, you know, even, even with pretty simple questions, it's going to be uh, trickier than with a 2D sample. Those are six really challenging things that are all a lot more difficult. And when you take them and, and add them all up, you know, your throughput is, is way, way reduced. Um, you know, best case scenario, 10, 10 times reduced, but it could be 100 or 1,000 folds reduced compared to 2D. Um, so you really want to make sure um, you absolutely need it and that the value is there and, um, you know, uh, it's still, you know, we hope, as I think Dan mentioned, we hope this is the right way to go. And I, I believe it is the right way to go in terms of 3D models. But um, just like, you know, our colleagues who are still really busy working in with biochemical assays, you know, we're going to have a, we're going to have a range of, of complexities and we're going to use them um together right so we might have some primary screening in 2d and then some 3d follow-ups and you know we use everything that's available to us but um just good to know the trade-off well uh let's go ahead and wrap up there we're out of time thank you so much to the panelists i really appreciate uh i knew this was going to happen the session flew by uh if you have any other questions please stop by the thermo fisher booth right afterwards and we'd be happy to answer any other questions uh, thank you so much, and please enjoy the rest of the show. Thanks, everybody. Take care of yourselves. Thanks, everyone. Bye. 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 Thanks, Nick. Take care.